And here we are, back at it, my friends, uh, firmly ensconced here at the EIB Southern Command, behind this, a golden EIB microphone, Rush Limbaugh here at 800 282 If you want to appear on the program, the uh, email address, if you'd rather send an email, lrushbow at eibnet.us. So I'm, I'm here in a sporadic way, able to catch some of the Democrats' impeachment filing against, uh, against President Trump and that he threatened the constitutional system. And the fact that he did this in the month of January is no reason to forget about it, that he threatened and almost destroyed the U.S. constitutional system. Now, all of that is an abject lie. None of that is true. They are lying about his role in the January 6th uh, uprising, or whatever you want to call it, at the, uh, at the U.S. Capitol, and they know they are. And they've got no guardrails. There's no reason for them not to. They don't have a media that's going to call them out on it. So they're literally, all of this is about making sure that Donald Trump can never, ever again have any role in American public life. There is a column today in the Washington Post. In fact, I intended to get to this a little later. But let me let me get down to this here since I've, since I've brought it up. Uh and it, actually, it's in the entertainment section. Trump wants a library. He must never have one. That's the headline of the story. It's a long story. It goes on. It's filled with blah, 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 blah. And they are abject. They're deathly afraid that Trump is going to triumphantly return to public life. And I'm not saying triumphantly return to the presidency. But they, they're not going to be able to stop this. They're not going to be able to stop Trump from having a public life if he wants it. And when that happens, and they are waiting in abject fear for that. They don't know how it's going to manifest. They don't know if it's going to be a press conference from Mar-a-Lago or a golf club. They don't have the slightest idea. So they're trying to ram through this impeachment business so that they can discredit anything he says anytime he says it. Because they're worried. You know what they're worried about here? Trump wants a library. He must never have. Who are these people to decide whether an ex-president deserves a library or not? If he can raise the money for it, then he can do a library. That's how it happens. Do you know who bankrolled much, I should say many, ex-president's libraries in the, shall we say, 2000s and the 1990s? Do you know who did it? You know who you know who the primary funders or bankrollees were? No, it was not Mr. Soros. It was Prince Bandar El Sultan and his friends from Saudi Arabia. Do I need to remind you that the king of Saudi, the late king, King Abdullah, Abdullah Abziz, Del El Saud, whatever, came over and visited George W. Bush for barbecue and stuff at the Texas ranch. And while he was here, he, you know, the ambassador to the United States from the Saudi, Saudi Arabia was Bandar bin Sultan. I think that was his name. He had homes all over the place. And the, the Saudis were worried the guy was becoming too Americanized and wouldn't go back to the uh, home country, Saudi Arabia. I don't know if he did or not. But no, the, the, the king of Saudi Arabia was for Clinton, I think. I don't know if it was major, but I know he was a participating fundraiser, donor. And the same thing for George W. Bush and maybe George H. W. Bush. That, that, that's one of the reasons for the alliance that we've had with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. The point is, if you can raise the money for your library, then it's not up to the Washington Post whether you get one or not. What they're worried about. Can you imagine a Trump presidential library? We have the Clinton Library Massage Parlor. Can you imagine what the traffic is to the Clinton Library Massage Parlor? Not much, because you have to have a special admission ticket for the massage parlor part. That's not open to the public. You get it's a special little buzzer. You know, you put in the palm of your hand, and you have to tell the right person, I'm here for the, visit the massage parlor. And if it buzzes, you get in. If it doesn't buzz, 
you don't get in. And no, I'm making that up. But wouldn't that be funny? I mean, I'm here for the. Mm, I don't think there's an Epstein Epstein wing, a J Jeffrey Epstein wing, the Clinton Library. No, no, not not here. There may be a Clinton wing at some Epstein property somewhere, but I doubt I doubt that it's Clinton Library. No, they're worried that it would become the biggest tourist attraction in the country. That's what they're worried about. And it would. It would be that they are scared to death of any picture, any video, any any image that would confirm or testify to Trump's popularity. Because that's what they're really trying to destroy. And they don't know that all they're doing is really cementing it. 74, 75 million people voted for Donald Trump. The Democrats may think that they have the ability to convince 74, 75 million people that the guy they voted for is a reprobate and that they shouldn't have voted for him. But they tried that for four years, didn't they? And how'd that work out for them? They've been trying. They tried for four years. We talked about it yesterday. There was no truth to it whatsoever. They had a free reign. They could make up anything they want about Donald Trump. Think of it this way. Here you are, the Democrat Party. You have the FBI. You have the CIA. At least you have members of both that are sympathetic to the Washington establishment. <clears throat> and you have basically the knowledge that for the next four years, you can make up anything you want about Donald Trump, and the media will amplify it. In other words, you don't have any limits. So your objective is to destroy Donald Trump. You want to reverse, if you can, the election results, results of 2016. You want him out of there because you're scared to death what he represents. He represents an uprising of the people of this country against Washington, against the establishment. And it had been building for a long time. It had been building since Perot in 1992. Oh, yeah, it predated Trump. It was part, The Tea Party was part of this. Trump was just the first guy to come along and actually weaponize it in a political sense. But the Trump movement existed before there was Trump. And then he built it and grew it to the point of 75, 74 million voters. But stop and think, these Democrats going in the FBI, CIA, all these conspirators, MI5, MI6 in the UK, the intelligentsia from Oxford and, and Cambridge in the UK, they had a free run. They could make up anything they wanted about Donald Trump. All it had to have was some link to credibility. But they could make up anything they wanted, and the mainstream media would not only amplify it, the mainstream media would act as members of the team. And they chose Russian collusion. They thought they had set it up. They thought they had built a believable case about it, and they spent four years. Even after the no-choice Mueller report. The Mueller report had to report no collusion. That was the, that was the Maginot line, if you will. They couldn't go beyond that. This was always an effort to sway public opinion. And that's what they hoped they had done by the time the Mueller report was filed and came out. But they couldn't actually conclude that Trump had colluded because he hadn't and there wasn't any evidence for it. So all they could do was get close. Get close in the effort of shaping public opinion. The more and more people believed it, mission accomplished in their minds. So four years of this, folks... And they remain scared to death of the guy. They are very much aware of his popularity. They're very much aware that he beat them back. So they're doing everything they can. They now, it's the same 
cabal. It's the same kind of people, same bunch of people with the same mindset who are now in this second impeachment and doing what they can to maneuver and manipulate public opinion against Trump because they are scared to death of a public reemergence. They're trying to destroy whatever credibility he has remaining. And this library business, they're deathly afraid that it would become the biggest tourist attraction in the country. Now, we need to wrap up a little business from yesterday. We spent some time talking about one of the founders of the Lincoln Project, this never-Trumper bunch, John Weaver. John Weaver, New York Times story, indicated that Mr. Weaver had uh, sexually abused a minor and had made his uh, advanced sexual advances against men on men. He'd been caught doing this. And one of them, at least one, was a minor. And so all day, yesterday and then the day before, we had members of the Lincoln Project, like George Conway, who appeared on TV constantly with Mr. Weaver. We Weaver ran the McCain campaigns in, uh, in 2000, 2000, 2000, what is it? Yeah, 2000, uh, what, what was it? 2008, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. So Weaver was all of the, the McCain family knew this guy. Everybody knew this guy. And they all, well, we had no idea. We had no idea. He's hitting on minor guys. We had no idea that he was deviant like this. We had no idea. George Conway, the wife of Kellyanne Conway, had written op-eds with him, appeared on TV with him. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, my God. Oh, I don't know. Oh, this is so devastating. Oh, this is so bad. Oh, I don't know. I didn't know anything. Oh, this is so bad. You knew it all. Everybody knew it. Just like everybody knew what was being cooked up against Trump. Audio soundbite number one. Here's Carl Rove yesterday afternoon on the story with Martha McCallum. Her question, the Lincoln Project, a lot of accusations from young men. They called John Weaver a sexual predator. You mentioned that this was a concern of yours in 2004. Now, you know, Carl, this, this isn't something that anybody wants to be vindicated on. Turns out that you were right about it. I've actually known about this pattern of behavior since 1988. All I want to say is, is that the 21 statements from those 21 young men who talked about uh, how they'd been approached by Mr. Weaver, that statement speaks for itself. And um, I don't have anything to add to it. It's a sad, sad chapter. Now, just yesterday, the, one of the many themes of the program was that everybody knew about the Russia hoax. The people involved in running it, the people involved in deploying it, they all knew. Well, it turns out they all knew about McCain's right-hand man. McCain probably knew. Cindy McCain probably knew. Where does it stop for the people that knew? Rove is admitting he's known about this since 2004. That's what Martha McCallum said. You mentioned this was a concern of yours in 2004. Oh, wait, he said 88. I've actually known about this pattern of behaviors in 1988. Why wasn't anything done about it? And when this guy is running around ripping Donald Trump as unfit for office on the basis he's a deviant, on the basis that he has no morality, where were all these people saying, John, shut up, you're not the guy to carry the message? Well, he was the co-founder. They weren't going to tell him to shut up. Now, here is the guy that wrote the story in the New York Times. This guy's name is Ryan Gerdusky, and he was on with Laura Ingram last night, the Fox News channel. See, you say you have proof that the Lincoln Project members are lying when they said that they had just learned recently of Weaver's depravity. What do you mean? This was the biggest open secret in Washington, D.C. The Lincoln Project was used for two purposes, a grift to make money and as a predatory grooming organization for John Weaver to get young men into bed. I mean, what you've seen in the media is nothing compared to what the messages I have are. 
and I'm not out to embarrass somebody, but they are descriptive, they are disgusting. I had 30 young men. Another writer had over 50. It's probably over 100 young men in a five-year period. Bill Cosby would blush at the actions of John Weaver. It was the biggest open secret in Washington, D.C. Liberals I spoke to about the project I was working on knew about John Weaver. And the media ran cover for John Weaver and for the Lincoln Project. Yeah, why? wonder why, why they did that. Because they were all part of the effort to get rid of Trump, so they ran cover for the guy. But here you have this reporter. He didn't even include in his initial report the things he's divulging here. The biggest open secret in Washington, the Lincoln Project. Mr. Sturdley, have you heard this? Have you heard anywhere besides this guy said the Lincoln Project was used for two reasons? A grift to make money and as a predatory grooming organization for John Weaver to get young men into bed. Have you ever heard that that's what the Lincoln Project was about? Not until now. Same thing for me. Not until now. A grift to make money. In other words, the two primary reasons for the existence of the Lincoln Project are illegitimate. Or at least they are not the lofty ideals that they profess. A grift to make money and as a... So the Lincoln Project, all these guys in it, apparently were aware to one extent or another that they were part of a project to help John Weaver coerce young men into bed. And this reporter, Ryan Gerdusky, says that everybody knew this. Oh, got to take a break, folks. I just saw the clock. Back in a minute. Rush Limbaugh pointing the way on the EIB network. I have a minor correction. We always do these corrections. The moment I find out I have been in error, Ryan Gadursky, sorry, Ryan Gurdusky, who wrote the story on John Weaver, is not with the New York Times. I assumed he was because the New York Times did the story. He's an independent author, an independent journalist. He broke the story on his own a couple weeks ago, and then the New York Times ran the story. And that's what I saw, and I just, uh, I just assumed that it was um, that he was a Times reporter. Not true. Uh, it's not a big deal, but as I say, when I discover I've been wrong about something, I run the correction right as soon as I discover it. You know, we keep digging for more clips on John Weaver because it's so illustrative of the fakery and the hypocrisy of all of these never-Trumpers. It's just beyond the pale. And we've got another one. This is from June 28th of last year on PBS, a program called The Open Mind. I think I coined the phrase that the army of the decent are coming together in a grand coalition to hopefully oust Donald Trump and his enablers. We've known, you and I certainly have known, and many others, from day one that this president was unfit to hold office. He was unfit morally. This from the guy founding the Lincoln Project, who Gerdusky says had two purposes, a grift to make money, and is a predatory grooming organization for John Weaver to get young men into bed. And that everybody knew that it was one of the worst kept secrets. It might have been a hundred young men in a five-year period. Bill Cosby would be jealous. Uh, not of the men part, but be jealous of the operation. Anyway, sit tight. We'll be right back. No. Talent on loan from God. 
Rush Limbaugh, your guiding light. Behind the one and only golden EIB microphone. Now look at this. National security news. This is from the Washington Free Beacon. State Department spokesperson. The largest threat to U.S. national security are United States cops. The State Department has a newly installed deputy spokesperson. Her name is Jelena Porter. She said in a 2016 Facebook post that the biggest threat to U.S. national security are U.S. cops. Not ISIS, not Russian hackers, not anyone or anything else. American cops. Now, her comments uh, on Facebook were made on September 20th, 2016, and they appear to be in reference to video footage released that day of an unarmed black man being shot by police officers in Tulsa. Uh, look, the Biden administration hired the person, is the point, she's a deputy spokeswoman. She has worked for a think tank that employed Hunter Biden. She was also a cheerleader and dancer for the Oakland Raiders and the Washington Wizards of the NBA. So you can see why she was hired. She got a link to Hunter Biden. Worked for a think tank that employed Hunter Biden. Biden canceled a major foreign policy speech, folks. Two inches of snow. Kid you not, Biden canceled a Monday trip to the State Department to deliver his first major policy address, citing the two inches of snow that fell in Washington. I don't know, maybe Biden saw his shadow. What is this? Two inches of snow is going to shut down? Biden's going to put a lid on it for that? Biden's also considering revoking Trump's access to all intelligence data, which is something that ex-presidents are routinely afforded uh, for a period of time after they have been president. New York Post with the story, the Biden administration is considering revoking Trump's access to intelligence briefings. White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki said, yeah, it's something obviously that's under review. Mind you, I need to remind you that John Brennan, James Clapper, and James Comey still have access to White House intelligence briefings. They still get to see the, the intel. Trump said that he revoked Brennan's, but Brennan claims he still has his. This is... Amazing, especially when you consider all these former administration officials that still have theirs, and Trump has been told that he is going to have his canceled. Are you all aware of the uh, latest with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? It is, it is a fascinating thing to bear witness to. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez claims that she is a sexual assault survivor. From January 6th in the Capitol building, New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Monday revealed that she is a survivor of sexual assault. Have you seen this video, folks? If you haven't, it's 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 amazing acting. She was speaking to 100,000 people on Instagram Live. She described what she went through during the Capitol riot. She addressed suggestions from some Republicans that Americans move on from this. Come on, you can't keep living off what did or didn't happen on January 6th, she was told. She said, the reason that I'm getting emotional in this moment is because these people who tell us to move on, these are the same tactics of abusers. And I am a survivor of sexual assault, she continued, her voice breaking. I haven't told many people this in my life. 
She then went on to tell more than 130,000 viewers that no matter what kind of abuse or neglect that they have experienced, trauma compounds on each other. She detailed frightening experiences during the siege, including how a man she believed to be a rioter broke into her congressional office as she hid in the bathroom. She recalled hearing this guy yell, where is she? Where is she? This was the moment where I thought everything was over, said Ocasio-Cortez. I thought I was going to die. I have never been quieter in my entire life. Her legislative director later told her to come out, explaining the man was a Capitol Police officer. This woman, need I remind you, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a member of Congress. So she is in the bathroom of her congressional office. And a Capitol Police officer is asking for her whereabouts. Where is she? Where is she? She got frightened for her life. She thought that she was going to die, folks. She thought a sexual abuser was waiting for her. She told 130,000 people this. It turns out that there was a Capitol Hill police officer looking to secure her safety. And now she claims she's a sexual assault survivor because of this. She was not sexually assaulted. I've seen the video. She talks about this. She, has, she hid behind the door. She made sure the door didn't hit her as people were opening it. She was never quieter in her life. She never did a better job of hiding her existence. I mean, you, th this, is, this is just not normal. I, I, I don't know how else to categorize this. Now, there's a story about this at uh, Spectator U.S., and it's uh, titled AOC's Body Politics. Let me just give you some pull quotes. Here's the first one. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has somehow not yet dried the well of public sympathy for the January 6th storming of the Capitol, linked the experience to an alleged sexual assault she suffered in the past. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I watched the video. I thought she was saying this event was sexual assault. Apparently, it's something that happened in the past. Here's the quote. The reason I'm getting emotional in this moment is because these folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what happened, or even telling us to apologize. These are the same tactics of abusers. And I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And I, I haven't told many people that in my life. But when we go through trauma, trauma compounds on each other. Trauma compounds on each other. What does that mean? Trauma compounds on each other. Now, whatever, this is gross manipulation. It got me. You know, I'm a master communicator. All of you know this. It is my primary job skill. And she words this in such a way as if you watch the video, you will be convinced she's talking about this event now, she purposely obfuscates this, I believe, to make it look like she can have it either way. Either, no, 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 if you misunderstand, she was talking about this event being sexual abuse. No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant I did something in the past. She wants this both ways. It's gross manipulation, and she should be ashamed. And I'm not talking about ashamed for sharing she was sexually assaulted. I have no way of knowing whether or not her story is true. And besides, it's irrelevant to the issue of storming the Capitol. What's it got to do with the issue of storming the Capitol? The real story here is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez used her alleged trauma as a cudgel against her political opponent. She has weaponized her alleged experience of sexual trauma to silence anybody who criticizes her. 
This is from the art. It's a pull quote. Amber Athey is who wrote this. And that is exactly right. And this is classic of how the left uses speech to silence all opponents. She has taken her alleged experience of sexual assault to silence anybody who criticizes her. You're not allowed to criticize her. She suffered trauma. You're not allowed to be critical. No, she was sexually abused. You can't prove it. You have to go on what, what she says as being true, but, but she's got no evidence. She doesn't advance any evidence. She had to bring sexual assault into her discussion about the Capitol riot because her telling of events is way overly dramatic. And according to Amber Anthony, it's delusional. Most people will be discouraged from saying so because they don't want to be accused of being misogynistic or insufficiently sensitive to her trauma. So most people besides Amber Anthony aren't going to have the guts to properly characterize this. But you ought to see this video if you haven't. I mean, it's, it's, it's filled with uh, acting and uh, gyrations of the body in order to transmit the nature of the assault she feared was happening all over again. And it was a sexual assault that she was being reconnected to. So you have no right to be critical because this is a traumatic event so forth and so on. Anyway, i got to take a brief break again. Time marches on. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Rush Limbaugh. The big voice on the right. On the in Parker, Colorado. Great to have you with us. Hello. Hi, Rush. It's an honor to speak to you. Finally got through. Hey, I have a quick question for you. So I've been really thinking about this whole scam, hoaxy impeachment. And if they know, if the Democrats know that this is going nowhere, why... And they're so afraid of Donald Trump and, you know, everything he comes out of his mouth. Then why would they give him such a grand platform? I mean, the whole world's going to be watching this. Because they think their platform is going to be bigger. Hmm, interesting. I, even though they think they, they, they know they're going to lose and they're going to be able to get to say what they're going to say, but it does it definitely gives them... No, they don't, they don't look at the... No, 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 wait a minute. Why do you think they're looking at this as a lose-lose thing? Well, I think they're just simply because he's not going to be convicted. Well, I think he. They... Do we lose her connection on to him? I get that, but Trump's Trump's Trump. He's going to do what he's do. Okay. Darlene, we're having all kinds of trouble with your with your connection. Uh, let me try it one more time. Why do you think the Democrats know that they're going to lose this? Right. I think they well because they're going to lose it. They said they can't they can't acquit him, right? That's been pretty much okay. So that okay, so they don't have the votes to acquit, uh, convict. They don't have the votes to convict him, so he is going to be acquitted. But that's not why they're doing this. They're not doing this to actually convict him. They're doing this to continue the smear. They're running the show. They determine all of the rules. And they're looking at this as an opportunity. Look at th their, their first impeachment was a joke, and they still went through with it. They had no idea how that boomeranged on them. They think they won that. They think they won with Adam Schiff and his committee and all this garbage on the phone call to Ukraine. They're looking at this as an opportunity to shape public opinion even more against Trump. They have an opportunity here to continue to impugn, to criticize, to make up whatever they want about the guy. They've got the mainstream media in their back pocket to amplify whatever they say. So this is just an ongoing. And by the way, there's another thing here besides that. It's all about sending messages to anybody that might be thinking of doing what Trump did. Don't try it. Don't think that you can get away with it. We'll treat you just like we're treating Trump. There is all kinds of reasons for them doing this. And the fact that, that they're not going to get a conviction is the 
is way down on the list. Now, they're doing this to continue the smear. Here's uh, Amy in Los Angeles. Welcome. Great to have you. Hi. Rush, it's always a pleasure to speak to you and, and wishes and prayers for all the best for you. Thank you. Um, as you're talking about President Trump and libraries, it occurred to me that President Trump will do branch libraries. Imagine a, president, a Trump presidential library in every state, in every major metropolitan area. They will not know what to do with that. Well, that would take a lot of money. Well, people... That's true. I mean, 50 libraries or 48, 46, whatever. That, that would take a... I guarantee if they raise that much money, the temptation to use some of it uh, to go out and buy the latest iPhone is going to be really tempting. They would be smaller libraries, though. You could have... Oh, smaller. You could have a bigger one in, you know, where Trump wants it, and then you'd have, like, a smaller branch oh. library, like a sub... Library, so it's it would still be interesting. To, it's interesting to ponder. It could but, drive them nuts. But, it also says up here that you think I'm in deep trouble now because you think that I am going to make a lot of people mad over my Alexandria Ocasio Cortez comments on sexual abuse. What did I? What did I do wrong? Yeah, I mean, it, it really uh, uh, hurts me to think I agree with her. But let me just say that Rush, Rush, you probably never have been experienced trauma or abuse. And I, I certainly didn't... Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Why do you think that? I'll tell you why. Because as you're describing what AOC said, what she's talking about is if you've experienced a trauma or an abuse, and then you experience another trauma or another abuse, that trauma piles on. It, it, it yeah. doesn't go away. Yeah. And so she had this trauma uh, on the 6th, and it... It sort of gins up past trauma. That's what which is sexual abuse. It. And so you think I went over and off the rails because I was what making light of it? I think that any woman, any person who's ever been sexually abused or been through trauma is going to find that insensitive All and right. like. All right, look, I appreciate. It. I'm out of time, but I appreciate that. I have to think about this. Where As we free go speech forward, still thrives. Rush on the EIB network. Okay, answer me this. Why didn't AOC ever mention her sexual abuse, alleged sexual abuse? during the Me Too movement, when that was hot and heavy. Where was she then? Anyway, there's more. Be back here in just a second. Welcome back. Rush Limbaugh on the cutting edge of societal evolution. Great to be with you, my friends. Our telephone number, if you want to be on the program, 800-282-2882. And the email address, lrushbo at eibnet.us. So, Amy in Los Angeles, says you got to be very careful here because if you make it sound like you are insensitive to sexual abuse, they're going to come after you. The only thing, look... I have no idea whether she was sexually abused or not, but the, if you see the video, it does look like that it is something worthy of exploitation that she thinks it can be exploited. Uh, it raises a question, why did she never mention her alleged sexual abuse when the Me Too movement was hot and heavy? Did she believe the sexual assault charges against Biden? What was that, Tara Reid? Was that her name? Did she believe those charges when Tara Reid, as I recall, not very many people on the left gave Tara Reid the time of day. 
So she supports Biden now while a an alleged victim of sexual assault. Um, it, look, you know, there are generational separators here. Um, like Amy in Los Angeles said, you obviously have never been, uh, never been abused. You know, there's all kinds of abuse, folks. There's sexual abuse, there's mind control, there's manipulation. There's, I mean, I could give you any number of different definitions of abuse. Like, for, for example, a hypothetical. Let's say that your spouse makes you think that he or she is serious about committing suicide practically every time you have an argument, every time you have a disagreement, and it's scary as hell, and you use that. You, you, that, that is, at, at its base level, that's an attempt at control. It's an attempt at manipulation. Is that abuse? Now, those of you who've had to deal with something like that know full well that it is, and you have to develop ways of dealing with it for your own peace of mind, for your own survival, for your own whatever you want to want to call it. I, I submit to you that there are many different definitions of abuse, not sexual abuse, but many definitions of abuse. Uh, there's post-traumatic stress disorder, which you could say is a uh, along the same lines of abuse that would be uh, PTSD, primarily people have had uh, very unsettling experiences in uh, combat, military combat, and so forth. Uh, but they're just, it's a generational thing. It's, it's, it's so prevalent that in older generations, it's just something that you dealt with. It's something that you, uh, you, you had to deal with and come up with ways of getting past it. In current generations, it's not that at all. It's it's uh, far more serious. It's given much more weight. Uh, it is considered to be uh, much more damaging in terms of shaping uh, people's personality and their decisions that they make as they as they live. It's just there's a new sensitivity to it. And I'm fully aware of that. But I just think it came out of the blue, and we haven't heard about this. Um, ever. We didn't hear about it during the Me Too movement. when w That would have been the ideal time for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to tell everybody that, oh, this is really good. I've been sexually abused. She didn't do it then. We don't know what she did about Joe Biden being accused of sexual abuse by Tara Reid. But part of abuse is trauma, is it not? And my only assertion here is that all of us experience trauma quite often. I've been fired seven or eight times. All but one of them was traumatic. I had to call my parents and tell them, you think that wasn't traumatic? No, I'm not comparing it to sexual abuse. Also, I was reading you pull quotes from a story at the Spectator US by Amber Athey, so let's not get totally lost here because some of the pull quotes I read, you might have assumed I was making the statements. But uh, I, as your host, am not insensitive to sexual abuse in any way. But I know liberals. I know how they, how they work. I know how they attempt to silence and discredit opposition. And I'm telling you, this by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a classic, as Amber Athey writes here. The real story is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez used her alleged trauma as a cudgel against her political opponents. She has weaponized her alleged experience to silence anybody who criticizes her. And to show you how it's working... I have a friendly supporter who call you better be real careful what you're saying here. It's obvious you've never been abused. How is it obvious? Maybe I should be proud that I don't wear that around. The, you know, that's, that's also something generational. You just didn't talk about things. You just lived your life. You dealt with it as it happened. Now you wear the badge.
generational changes, generational shifts. But Amber Athey believes that AOC weaponized her alleged experience to silence anybody who criticizes her. And I know the left does that. They, they have become champions at that. In fact, here's, uh, here's Jenny in Vail, Colorado. Great to have you. I'm glad you called. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Well, I just wanted to reframe it a different way. Because like you said, we've all been victimized. We've all had trauma. And certainly the amount of women that have been victimized is something like one in four. But what I would say is, Instead of saying, oh, gosh, why didn't she come forward or, oh, gosh, you know, whatever, what about looking at it like, why is she in office if she's so unstable and so victimized? Maybe she needs to resign because she's not a stable person at this point because obviously the six. of January has completely put her over the edge. So you think that it would be... uh more appropriate or a better use of the information to put forth the idea that maybe she's been so traumatized here that she's not qualified. She needs to get help instead. That's what you think would be a... a... Well, I think we all go through really incredible, horrible, bad times, and, and we have to seek the help we need at those times. And if this is something that is now opening up for her because of this trauma on the 6th of January, then she really obviously needs to be helped. And, you know, she's going to wear the badge. She needs to address what it is to be a victim and how to overcome it. All right. But for us to say that that means she should resign and take this seriously, that that would... That that wouldn't be met with any kind of approval. That would be they'd try to rip that one to shreds as well. But you're well, doing this on the basis of compassion. Is that what you're you're, you're suggesting? This on the basis of compassion rather than politics. Well, kind of. I'm just trying to think outside the box a little because instead of running around accusing each other of you know all this stuff, maybe you deal with your problem and and become strong for it. Instead of announcing it to 130,000 people, and you haven't seriously addressed it in your own life. And so clearly, she's facing PTSD issues. How well can she represent her constituents? Okay. Uh, Jenny, I appreciate your input on this. I'm looking for, I've got two stories on this, and I'm um, maybe three. Let me make sure. Um, Looking for the one that mentions the 130,000, that's not it. What did I do with it? What is it in the stack? Okay. Um, well, here are the two stories. Uh, one's from the New York Post. Uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez on Monday revealed that she is a survivor of sexual assault. A 31-year-old Democrat speaking to more than 100,000 people on Instagram Live described what she went through during the Capitol riot and addressed suggestions from some Republicans that Americans move on from the January... Oh, see, there it is. She's reacting to people. Come on, you guys drop it. January 6th. That was almost a month ago. Can we move on? And she's saying, look, I have been a victim of sexual assault. And that's what people, can't you just move on? Well, no, because these, these individual assaults compound. In other words, the trauma gets added. It doesn't go away. The trauma compounds. She said, I am a survivor of sexual assault, her voice breaking. I haven't told many people that in my life. That's true. She hasn't. She didn't tell anybody during the Me Too movement. She didn't tell anybody when Joe Biden was accused of it during the Democrat campaign. She went on to tell more than 130,000 viewers that no matter what kind of abuse they have experienced, trauma compounds on each other, meaning each incident of trauma compounds on all previous incidents so it doesn't go away it 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 gets worse is what she's saying with her voice breaking 
there's uh, there's something really big happens to you, and, and then you deal with it, and you move on, and then and then when something else happens, you deal with that. She later detailed frightening experiences during the siege, including how a man and this this is it gets somewhat confusing because if you watch this video, you almost conclude it would be a mistake to do it as we've learned but you can conclude that she's she's comparing this being sexually assaulted to this person who is opening the door to her office to her, to her bathroom in her office shouting where is she where is she she assumes somebody's come to kill her somebody's come to do big damage somebody's come to harm her and you could mistakenly conclude that she's talking about that as potential sexual assault since it's happened before. Her legislative director later told her to, it's okay to come out, it's safe. The guy is a Capitol Police officer. She says, this was the moment where I thought everything was over. In her bathroom, in her office, in the Capitol building on January 6th. And she's saying because she was a survivor of sexual assault, this incident compounds on that. And I was really scared. In other words, you don't, her theory is you don't get used to the abuse. It's not something that ever normalizes. It's something that, that, that stays with you forever. And then it happens again. And it only worsens, which... Which was, uh, which was her point. Here's Amy in Rochester, New York. You're next. It's great to have you with us. Hello. Hi, Rush. So nice to talk to you today. And you're sounding great lately, so so thankful. Well, thank you. Um, thank so you very much. You're welcome. I just wanted to say, so I'm from Rochester, New York, and I'm a former prosecutor in Fort Lauderdale. And as someone who has really gone through a sexual abuse and had to go through the full trial and go through everything, and then the person got a life sentence, so it's a real trial. I take issue with AOC and... Okay, wait, 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 hold, hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm having trouble following you here. Uh, wait, I just want to make sure I understand. You had to go through as a prosecutor? No, no, myself. As someone who really is a survivor. Oh, you you are a, you're, you're a, you're a victim and survivor, and you had to go through a full trial of everything. Right. And the, and the person yeah. accused of harassing you got a life sentence. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so you you have experienced all that, the trauma and everything associated with it. Okay. Right. So when you have Christine Balsey Ford and AOC, is someone, you know, pretending and what they did to Justice Kavanaugh, what it does to people who really live through it, it oh, minimizes yeah. or diminishes. What a great example. Really go through it. What a great example. Christine right. Balsey Ford and all these people piling on Kavanaugh. You talk about trauma? Being right. lied about with the most disgusting stories all right. over when the news every right. night for two weeks. Right. But then to the people who really do go through things, then it makes it you don't know who to believe. Right. Because you hear these stories. And I could tell you as someone what it did for me is it inspired me to become a prosecutor. Went to law school, went to UNC, and then I got to help people. So I kind of think what she's saying, I agree with the last caller. Maybe she just is unable to do her job because I went through it and I went to law school. I have an MBA with honors and I'm doing just fine. You don't forget it, but you can't let it ruin your life. Uh, How about that? Does she sound like somebody that you think is letting it ruin her life? No, she's saying that to manipulate the people who listen to CNN and read the New York Times. Okay. Just like the high pitched voice that Christine Balsi used. Oh yeah, ending each sentence on the uptake. That 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 is done to make yourself sound vulnerable. Uh, I'm so scared. I I I don't even I don't feel comfortable being here. I, I've just it it's just really scary. That kind of thing. Yeah, that's it's it's um it's another technique. Folks, that has been developed and used, and it's designed to manipulate people. And Ballsy Ford was great at it. But remember, again, she had the entire Democrat population of committee behind her and backing her up. She had the entirety of the media 
backing her up and amplifying her allegations. She had Senator Dianne Feinstein backing her up and amplifying her allegations. So she didn't, she didn't have to face as much trauma trying to bring forth her story as many other people would because the objective was political. It was to destroy, keep Kavanaugh off the court. We'll be back after this. Now, watch Rush on the Ditto Cam. And here's Jimmy, Jimmy in Gainesville, Georgia. Glad, uh, glad that you called, Jimmy. Welcome to the EIB Network. Hello. Hey, Rush. Thanks for taking my call. Firstly, I'd really quickly like to thank you for all you do for the Le Leukemia and Le Lymphoma Society. Um, leukemia took both my brother and my wife in the past. And speaking of uh, my wife, she was a victim years ago of... Uh, violent uh, attempted sexual assault and she never spoke of it she never spoke of the physical scars or the emotional or mental scars but when she was ever in a situation where she felt physically threatened it all came back the ptsd the whole thing and my point is there are plenty of things to question and even attack aoc on this this is not one of them this is this is not you don't need to go here how would how would she not have felt threatened in that scenario? How would anybody not have felt threatened, especially somebody as high profile as AOC with a crowd? She and she may not have known it, but they're outside chanting, chanting. Well, you have a you have a good chance. point. I must concede you have a good point. If you're in your bathroom in your office and some guy's opening the door and shouting, "Where is she?" Whether you've even been traumatized the past or not, that can be unsettling. If you think, absolutely, if you think the place is under siege. Uh, by whoever you think is conducting this operation, I can. Of course, there's no, there's no question about that. The, the crowd was not uh, an AOC-friendly crowd. It just was not, and I shudder to think what they would have done if they had physically encountered AOC or Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi or even Mike Pence, because they were hell bent for leather and, re and ready for blood. Some of them. I don't know. Wait a minute now. Some of them, not all of them. This is another thing. Enough of them. Pardon. Enough of them. It only takes one, and the, and the whole. You saw the, the video like I did. I also saw AOC's comments when she made them live, and it broke my heart because, you know, whether or not she's telling the truth about the the uh, physical or sexual assault, she is telling the truth. She was in the Capitol and she was under siege, and she she had to have felt threatened. I had to. I don't disagree. Then, then, she, she's then, then not why, the only. Why she, make light of it? Why make light of it? It's, you've got so much more material to work with. You don't need to go here. You're better than this. I wasn't making light of it. I'm sorry that I have been misunderstood about this. I was a couple steps ahead on this. I was not making light of it. I'm looking at everything I do. I look at it from the political because I think everything has been politicized. Well, let me let me rephrase. You don't need to make it out to be a, uh, a political tactic on her part. If it was, shame on her, but it doesn't need to be because she well, was I'm so, that's, the that, about the that she is where it. I naturally go because that is what I do. That is how I attempt to analyze how we are being attacked, criticized, whatever, by our political opponents. They have politicized virtually everything. They did it, not me. That's how I look at it in many other ways, too. Hi, welcome back. Great to have you with us, Rush Limbaugh, the EIB Network. Look, let me just say this. Let me apologize if anybody misunderstood what I was saying. It's my bad if that happened. I'm a master communicator. And my objective here, at whatever the issue being discussed, is to be perfectly understood. And apparently some people got the wrong idea for what I was saying about AOC and her uh, claim to have been uh, sexually abused and that that trauma added to trauma she was feeling during the siege of the Capitol on January 6th. So uh, it doesn't matter why. I just, I just uh, really regret that anybody didn't understand my primary point or reaction to this. It was not disputing that she has been abused. I have no idea whether she has or hasn't. So... If anybody thinks I was making light of it or laughing about it, uh, not the case. But it's not your problem, it's mine, for not effectively communicating what I really felt about it. So 
I'm sorry. Here is uh, Jared in Brainerd, Minnesota. Great to have you on the EIB Network. Hello. Hi, Rush. It's truly an honor to speak to you. Thank you, sir. And uh, prayers to you all the time. So um, way to clear that up. Uh, I think there's this, this is definitely a, a touchy subject. Uh, doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. Um, I don't dispute uh, her claims of abuse. Uh, not one bit. I think uh, she should definitely get her voice heard. But uh, I also think uh, I don't agree with her politics. But uh, as soon as you politicize this, and turn it into a, uh, a political issue. I, I think it uh, it warrants a discussion. And what is that discussion? Uh, we, we can't use abuse to politicize, hey, listen to me. I have a three-year-old daughter at home, and she can say, hey, my cousin hit me. And uh, I was watching him. Her cousin didn't hit her, but she just wanted to get some attention and she politicized her alleged abuse, and it, you know, it didn't happen in this instance. Yeah, I I understand. <clears throat> uh, you know, that's that's a challenging moment there for a parent, though. Uh, Three year old daughter at home, and she can say these things, and you have to react to it in a in a way that's going to affect the formative development of your daughter going forward that's that would not be an um, easy thing to do but jared i'm glad you called up next is pamela in canyon texas hello hi rush how are you i'm good thank you prayers for you and your family and we just hope you keep strong and keep going uh, thank you very now, much i now, really appreciate it's not a good time to go we need you to stay <laughs> <laughs> amen yes please listen in talking about AOC, you were not making fun of her. You were reporting what she said. And I look at it, she's always negative towards the American people. She's always talking about how much she doesn't like America. She wants to do things that she has no idea. You know, it's like uh, uh, she, she's this boss who has no experience doing anything, telling people what to do on how to do it. And I'm just, like I say, I just, I'm tired of people, it just seems in her case, she's just using things for attention. And when people call her out on it, she doesn't like it. I just, um, you know, I'm, I, I just, you know, I don't know whether it's true or not. I don't want to say her experience is true or not. But, you know, there's a lot of women who use this and they hurt men or other people in the process. I think it's yeah, very but unfair. but there are a lot of women to whom it does happen. Exactly, and I've got that, and, and I know that's the case. It's vicious. It, it it's just it's just a, such a hateful and evil thing to do uh, for attention. Um, and I just like I say, I am I'm I'm just you know with her with AOC, I just when I see her, I just ignore because I mean she's just. And and you're doing that because of the politics that you associate with her. That's why. Absolutely. But she just, you know, the policies that she wants, along with, I look at the Democratic Party and half of the Republicans, they're not American policies. They're not liberty. They don't want individuals to have freedom. They want to control with power and uh, along with control. Power well, control, you get money. Since we're talking about the politics, let me let me talk about the politics of this that is happening right now. Black Lives Matter movement yesterday, okay? Black Lives Matter movement yesterday put its weight behind a, behind a member of the squad. You know, AOC's little political group is called the squad. This particular member's name is Cori Bush. She's a Democrat from Missouri. She has proposed to investigate and potentially expel Republicans from the House who are uh, opposed to certifying the 2020 presidential election results following the siege in the Capitol. In other words, she supports a movement that would expel 100 Republicans from Congress simply because they opposed certifying the 2020 presidential election results. It's not enough 
this group. This is this is the squad. It's it's or the BL, actually it's Black Lives Matter writing. It's not enough to denounce the white supremacy behind the attack. We must remove its endorsers from Congress. Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Lauren Burbert, Republicans who voted against certifying the Electoral College. Now, if that isn't political, I don't know what is. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Democrats are trying to use the insurrection, quote unquote, to expel more than 100 Republican congressmen from Congress because they somehow wanted to object to the certifying of the 2020 presidential election, the Electoral College on January 6th before Congress. Now, that's who these people are. Black Lives Matter put its weight behind this, the squad's movement, or the squad's effort. It's their, it's their idea, Cori Bush, to expel 100 members of Repu Republican members of uh, Congress. And Black Lives Matter comes along and attaches themselves to the idea, trying to give it weight. So uh, that's how the politics of this stuff manifests itself. Now, are these 100 Republicans, why, why are they to be expelled? Because they don't accept? Remember yesterday, we, we went back to the story, George Stephanopoulos has got Rand Paul on his Sunday morning show on ABC, pretty much demanding that Rand Paul admit that Joe Biden was a legitimate winner and to denounce Trump, and Rand Paul wouldn't do it. And Stephanopoulos kept shouting at him, just say it, just say it. Now, what, what does it matter? You're George Stephanopoulos. You're a journalist at ABC, still running the Clinton War Room. You've got a Sunday morning show. you got a senator from Kentucky up there as your guest. What does it matter what he thinks? Why is it so important that you get Rand Paul to say it, that Joe Biden is legitimately elected? What does it matter? And my theory is that when the leftists get going, when they really, really demand people say things that represent what they believe, it's when they do not actually have the ability to prove it themselves. So they go to their political opponents, they put all this political pressure on them. Just say it! Just say it! Joe Biden is legitimately elected for Just say it! So if you can get a Republican senator to say it, you're off and running in convincing everybody else. Now, Rand Paul did not say it. He was under intense pressure to say it. And it's the same thing now. So now you have AOC and her squad demanding that 100 Republicans be expelled from Congress because they... Oppose certifying the 2020 presidential election results following the deadly siege on Capitol Hill. Carried out by Trump supporters. That's, that's their terminology. Anyway, another brief break as time marches rapidly. Fastest three hours in media. We'll be right back. Right Greetings and welcome back. Tune to the most listened to radio talk show in history. The most listened to radio talk show in the country. And it's Rush Limbaugh, your guiding light behind the golden EIB microphone. You know, folks, one, um, one side effect of the increasing number of people working remotely at home these days is the number of cyber attacks. They're increasing. It's not a good side effect. It makes sense when you think about it, though. Few homes are made as cyber secure as a company office environment is. Now, once a home office computer is breached or infected, a company's system and database becomes vulnerable to attack. If your information's in that database, then your online identity is exposed. Another sign of the times and another reason why protecting your own online identity is key 
crucial these days. And how do you do that? You do that with LifeLock. They are the leaders in online identity theft protection. Now look, no one can prevent, no one company can prevent all identity theft, but LifeLock's online monitoring systems and their restoration efforts, that's such an important part of this, combine to give you the best protection you can get. LifeLock monitors billions of online transactions every day. They look for evidence that your information, your credit card numbers, your bank accounts, all that stuff is being used illegally. And man, when they find it, they alert you. Or when they even think they've found it, they alert you and ask you if it is you opening a new bank account, making some purchase that's not uh, within the pattern of your purchases, and that's how they shut this stuff down. Turns out you're a victim. LifeLock's restoration team steps in, and they don't stop until they have fixed what has gone wrong. Now is the time to have LifeLock. Get their protection. LifeLock.com is the site to visit, or you can call them at 800-440-4833. Either way, Use my name and sign up today. That's how you get 25% off your first year. LifeLock.com, offer code RUSH, or 800-440-4833, and mention my name. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you got to keep something in mind here. It was about a week ago, just last week sometime, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez accused Ted Cruz of trying to murder her. You remember that? Now, was was she telling the truth then? Do you think Ted do you think Ted Cruz actually tried to murder AOC? Well, she says that he did. Was she telling the truth then? You know, the, the question that got all of this started about, about her uh, divulging that she had been sexually abused, the question that got it all started was, why don't you guys just move on? The January 6th thing was January 6th. The siege of the Capitol is in the, it's in the rearview mirror. It happened. Why don't you just move on? That's what triggered her to talk about her alleged sexual abuse. And that's when she said, look, these, these instances of abuse don't ever go away. They compound on one another, she said, meaning the impact is added to each new instance of abuse. And what she went through during the siege on January 6th was abuse on top of which she then shared was her sexual abuse, and so forth. So, put it another way, she was asked why she can't move on from January 6th, and she said because of her alleged sexual abuse. She politicized it, not me. She did. Anyway. We have uh, da, 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 Sarah in Glendale, Arizona. It's great to have you. Welcome to the program. Hi. Hi, Rush. I pray for you every single day. Thank I you. I love you. <laughs> of course. So this is not about AOC. I apologize. I can't stand her. So um, That's okay. Me that, that's, <laughs> believe me, don't worry about that. Okay. Well, I just want to tell my story real quick and just ask your advice. My husband and I lived in New York City for over 20 years. I was on the show America's Next Top Model and had a very good career as a model and actress in New York. And yes, I was sexually harassed there all the time. It's just whatever. And my husband and I said, okay, we're done. We had a child. We got married. And we said, where do you want to move um, where we can be free? We we're both staunch conservatives. We were not being represented in New York anymore. They actually hated us. I had to hide it almost my entire career there. Um, and so we moved to Arizona. And lo and behold, we had no idea that Arizona was such a fractured state. I've always loved politics. I've always been very political. And I think that's mostly my passion. Um, and so I really wanted to start running for office here and get my name out there. But it's a fraction. I've, I've gone to the meetings. I don't think I'm entitled to anything. I don't think anything. I've gone to meetings. I've met people. And it is so fractured. It's almost just disheartening to say, what is the point? Because even within the Arizona 
Republican Party, they're fighting. And so I don't know. And, you know, my husband, patient, oh. I, I'm half Iranian. My mom fled Iran, my dad, in 1979. Like, we love America. We know how amazing this country is. And I, I can't scream at my TV anymore. I can't scream at everybody. I'm just like, what do we do? What do I do? And I would love to run for office. I was thinking of Congress, but if I have to start, you know, but what? Okay, I mean, but wait a minute now. You're not going to do it. Is that right? Simply because Arizona is so fractured, you don't think you could win? I No, I, I don't know because I, I was a Trump supporter. And I am, I, I, you know, it's almost as if they're they're taking that away from us, even the Republican Party. It's like you can't even talk about that. Um, I would be taking on another Republican who is in my district if I did run. Okay, He's a look, very well-known person okay. here. So I don't, I don't know. Okay, yeah. let, let me, I, I don't have time to uh, uh, answer what you're going to, she's going to seek my advice. I know this because that's what it says up there as a result of the call screening effort, but she still hasn't gotten there. So I have to stop her because we've got a commercial break coming up that I can't move. So I'm going to tell I will answer your your advice question as soon as I can, Sarah. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. We'll be back in just a second. Rush Limbaugh, because we know for you, only the best will do. On the EIB Network. <laughs> apologize again ladies and gentlemen uh, this is a third apology today one i got well this is the second one i got something wrong um one in the first hour and this one and that is our last caller from uh, arizona sarah in glendale she did ask for my advice i just didn't hear her so two things happened here you've got a cell call with not very good reception and somebody speaking very quickly and I'm trying to follow it on uh, on a transcription. And the transcription is always a little late. It can't be instant. And so uh, I'm trying to do those two things at once. And she did ask for my advice. I just didn't hear it. And I didn't see it. So at the end of her call, I kind of admonished her for not getting to the point of her call, which she did. I just didn't hear it. So, Sarah, I am deeply sorry. I'm so sorry. I hope you can forgive me. I just didn't hear you. I didn't hear you ask me. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, in terms of the answer to the, what are you laughing at in there? What? I didn't see it. You guys heard her. I'm sure you heard her ask for my advice, but I didn't. I didn't realize it until later. Anyway, uh. What what I've had some time now to study uh, what she said, and she's trying to go through the hoops. The party is demanding that she go through, and for for example, the party thinks the Republican Party. She wants to run for office. She's a Trumpist. The Republican Party thinks you need to come up through the ranks. You need to run for a local school board or or some local office and do that for a while, then step up to dog catcher and then step up to something. And then maybe 10 years into your political career, maybe run for Congress. Either the House or the Senate. And I think that, frankly, now is BS. When I was young, that's how things were done. When I was in my business, that's the only way you could advance aside from knowing somebody. And that's always been the case. There are elites everywhere. There is a deep state in every organization, be it a city, a town, a big city, a major city, doesn't matter. And if you knew somebody, then you could use the connection. And, but most people didn't know anybody high enough. So you started small. And you proved yourself at every step along the way. I had to start 
little radio station in my hometown. I worked there for, well, let's see, 1966 through 1975 years. And then I got a job at a suburban station in Pittsburgh. You just climb the ladder, hoping that somewhere along the way you get a break. And I didn't get mine for 20 years. Sacramento, 19, maybe longer, 1984. So 66, yeah, about 20 years. And that's just how you did it. But today, look at what we learned with GameStop. Some guys on GameStop earned enough money to put their kids through college for four years in one day. Earned enough money in one day. Go tell them to start small. They'll laugh you out of the room. Those, and these are generational things, it's not generationally necessary. You can still do it that way. You can still start small, get experience, build yourself up. But that's the long way now. And you're going to see, if you choose that route, you're going to see other people who are not choosing that route, and they're going to be getting ahead. They're going to be earning a decent amount of money. Not everybody, of course, but some are. You'll see it. So I would apply the same thing here to politics. It used to be that's how you had to advance in politics, in electoral politics. You'd have to start small and keep building up, build a name for yourself, establish a good works agenda. What? Happened. But now... Look at Trump. Trump was elected president, had never run for anything. That's reason number one, they hate the guy. He ran for president and won. Not supposed to be possible. Not in any way, shape, manner, or form. That was the, the thing that outraged them as much as anything. Before you even get to his personality. Before you get to the object, object, uh, objectionable things about his uh, personality and all that, just the fact that he showed them up. I say you don't even need any experience to be elected to the top office in the world. He did it, and he did it relative, and he did it beating Hillary Clinton, which that was not supposed to be possible. So they despised the guy from the get-go for that alone. So, Sarah, whether you're a Trumpist or not, go for it. Take what you believe, start your campaign, and go for it. Now, uh, I know you're running in a Republican primary, or in a, well, you're running as a Republican, and the and the party thinks that you need to go for school board and run on up and you know, go your your individual steps or ladder rungs or what have you, but but you support the Trump agenda. The question you have to ask yourself is this: Does the Republican that you would be primarying support the Trump agenda or not? If the Republican you're going to be running against does not support the Trump agenda, go for it. If the Republican you're going to be primarying does support the Trump agenda, then you would have to ask yourself, do you want to get into a contest where you're going to be better at implementing and supporting and defending it than this other guy is? But I think it's like any other job in the world. If you want it and if you have the passion for it, having the passion for it is what's going to, is what's going to make you endure all the garbage that's part of it. And there's a lot of that, no matter what the job is, in politics or anything else. It is your passion. Like I mentioned, I got fired seven times. My passion is what allowed me to remain dedicated to my desires. My desires were the top of the list of why I did what I did and why I was willing to put up with all the garbage. And you've got to have the same kind of passion for what you want to do. But don't, don't let the party's antiquated thinking uh, steal your passion from you. If you think you're the answer, if you think you've got the ticket, if you think you are what people in Arizona need, then by all means, go for it. And if you're not successful the first time, try again. If you find out that you really love it in this campaign then go for it. I'm all for people doing what they love, whatever the circumstances of the moment happen to be. 
There are obviously circumstances that are going to be more opportune than others, depending on your timing. Some of them you can control, some of them you can't. But if you've really got a passion for this, there's no, there's no way to stop you. You'll eventually succeed at this. And you need to have that confidence about it. That's the way, that, that, that's the advice I would give you. Now, Ron DeSantis, this guy has got what we call an iron enforced spine. The governor of Florida, in a 45 minute speech this morning, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, identified big tech companies as the leading threat to American democracy and freedom of expression today and pledged that Florida Republicans would take action. He accused the tech giants of clear viewpoint discrimination, highlighting the censorship of Donald Trump and the removal of Parler from the Internet and Apple and Google-controlled app stores. He said the core issue here is this. Are consumers going to have the choice to consume the information they choose or are oligarchs in Silicon Valley going to make those choices for us? No group of people should exercise such power, especially not tech billionaires in Northern California. And man, oh man, is that right. And tell me, where else do you hear anybody speaking out like in government? Yeah, you have some op-ed writers, some other people speaking out on this, but this, you don't hear elected officials so much. Well, some members of Congress do. I'm looking for a piece that I have. Here it is. I found it. Uh, Miranda Devine in the New York Post today has a great piece on the same subject, and that is these tech oligarchs literally running the news business, running the opinion They're running the information business in America. And we are watching, let me just tell you, we are watching the de facto merger of media and social media and state government. The merger of giant corporations and state. This is when Democrats control Washington. The propaganda arm of the Democrat Party has never been more powerful than today. And don't forget that they've got Antifa and Black Lives Matter soldiers as their military arm. Republicans who do not cave to the extraordinary pressure exerted on them in Washington today. You know who they are? They're tomorrow's leaders. Republicans who do not cave to all of this are tomorrow's leaders. Trump is the model going forward. Yes, sirree, my friends. Donald Trump is the model. You find something interesting. It was just made uh, uh, where to me. I got a note from somebody. You know, it's been two weeks we haven't heard from Trump at all. Two weeks. That hasn't happened in four years. Two weeks. In these same two weeks, we've heard nothing but Trump, Trump, Trump from the Democrats and the media. And I had the same observation today. I was watching CNN, and they were doing a story about how incompetent the Trump team was last December in the Oval Office. And I said to myself, is it so bad that there's no news? That the only story you've got is what a rotten guy Trump was last December? It was a story about how conspiracy theories were the dominant subject in a knockdown, drag out discussion, conversation in the Oval Office in the middle of December. I'm saying, you know, we've got a brand new president. We've got we've got all kinds of stuff happening. We've got the impeachment coming up, and all you guys at CNN can do is a long drag out story on Donald Trump's December. He's gone. He's no longer president. It doesn't matter. And yet it does. Apparently to them, they are not going to let up on the gas pedal, folks. They're going to continue 
whatever they think they have to do to destroy the guy, to impugn the guy, to ruin the guy, his family, supporters, they're not going to let up on the gas. Just amazing. So here's Miranda Devine. She says, and, and, and Facebook's squad of thought police is, is her piece. She says, when you, when you see him speak, it's hard to believe that such a gormless geek as Mark Zuckerberg may be the most powerful person in the free world. But socially inept tech oligarchs now wield unprecedented power to censor political thought and speech, and they are transforming America into an authoritarian surveillance state. For now, and that's the key in that sentence, for now it is conservatives that they are silencing and demonizing in partnership with the Democrat Party. For now. But after a while, when they think that they have finished that, they're going to move on to whoever else is insolent. And they're going to begin to demonize and silence that group. Who will it be? We don't know. But they're not going to stop exercising this power they have simply by vanquishing conservatives. This kind of power you have fun using. And they're going to be doing it day in and day out. Now, we already know Silicon Valley leans left. But the partisan power of big tech was laid bare this month when they acted in concert to censor Donald Trump and his 74 million voters and then crushed free speech competitor Parler. Now Facebook has turbocharged its woke corporate agenda with a new vice president of civil rights. An Obama administration alumnus obsessed with systemic police racism and a global oversight board of retired politicians and human rights activists paid to rubber stamp Facebook's crackdown on conservatives, a.k.a. domestic terrorists. So Facebook has hired a new squad of thought police aimed at conservatives. For now. For now. Trump is the model going forward. He hasn't, I think this is two weeks he has not said a word. The Democrats have doing nothing, have done nothing but talk about Trump. I think they've been trying to get Trump to react. They've been trying to get Trump to say something in response to what they're doing. He has not taken the bait. But they can't forget him. They can't. They're not going to ever be able to forget the media. CNN will never see the day where they do not lead with a story on the Trump administration, even if it's three years from now. Quick time out because we got to go. Back in just a second, folks. Stay with us. Treat yourself to the Limbaugh letter. story here on the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. And I want to get into it with an audio soundbite. This was from her press briefing just this afternoon. In the White House press briefer, uh, a reporter said, the impeachment managers have laid out their case. Trump's team is leaving open the door, it seems, to arguing election fraud in this trial to repeating the false claims that somehow Trump won the election. Those same false claims that fueled the riot. Is this administration concerned that the former president's defense could incite further violence in Washington? Certainly watching uh, reactions in the country, watching the potential for violence is something that we will do closely uh, from uh, the White House. Um, across the country, no matter what prompts it. Uh, and that's something we will uh, certainly keep an eye on. Um, but, um, you know, I think in this case, as you know, uh, there have been dozens and dozens of court cases that have been debunked. Boy, this woman says, um, a lot. 
Uh, and that's something we will all certainly keep an eye on. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think in this case, uh, as you know, um, uh, there have been dozens of, you talk about communication, wandering in vain search of a thought. We will monitor the country for violence during the impeachment trial. See, once again, setting the stage, mind control, run around. All this, all it took was for a question from an unidentified reporter. So Trump's team is leaving open the possibility that they might claim falsely that Trump won the election. And these same false claims are what fueled the riot. Are you worried that Trump could incite further violence? Oh, that's all it takes. An innocuous question from an unidentified reporter. And you have a brand new story that the Biden administration will be monitoring America for violence during the impeachment trial. Even though we don't have any hard evidence that anything like that will happen. Such a load, folks. It is such a, any, the story about Jen Psaki, this is a Breitbart story. Report shows Biden staff pre-screening Pasaki press briefing questions. You know, this, this woman, Jen Pasaki, worked with Hillary in many of the last four years. She doesn't know the answer to most of the questions she's asked. She's got this thing. She says, I'll circle back to you on that. But they're pre squid This means the White House press corps is submitting their questions in advance to staff who is then briefing Pasaki on them before she... A quick question. Do you think there's a civil war going on in the Republican Party right now? The drive-by media believes that there is. A civil war going on in the Republican Party. I'll weigh in on it here in just a second. I want to get back to this story at Breitbart about Jennifer Pasaki. Pre-screening, press briefing question. This is, a, this is a new one. They never even accused Sean Spicer of that. She's pre-screening, which means that the assembled multitudes of press people have to willingly go along with this. They've got to submit their questions. Can you imagine how the stories must go? Look, we uh, we really want to answer your question. We gotta we gotta submit this to the press secretary so that she can she can prepare uh, her response uh, and give you the most uh, up to date answer that she can. And the press corps says, sure, whatever you need. I have no doubt. Now, later on in this story, there is an allusion to the way the press is going to be covering the new Biden administration in general. Now, get this paragraph. Jim Acosta, CNN, in an Atlantic piece published in December. So he was interviewed by The Atlantic for a story they're doing. Basically, see, and then what are you going to do when Trump's no longer in the White House? What are you going to do? I can tell you they're still going to be talking about Trump. That's all they were doing this morning. Jim Acosta said in this interview to The Atlantic, I don't think the press should be trying to whip up the Biden presidency and turn it into must-see TV in a contrived way. Oh, you mean you don't think that CNN should treat the Biden administration the identical way you treated the Trump administration? In a contrived way. You tried to whip the Trump presidency and turn it into must-see TV on the premise that Trump never told the truth. He never was honest about anything. He was a reprobate and scum. 
but you don't think it's necessary. You don't think the press should be trying to do the same thing with the Biden presidency. Now, we understand that. These people are going to make them, they already have, move back to quote-unquote normalcy as rapidly as they can. Then there is this from CNN reporter Daniel Dale. He was also interviewed for the piece in The Atlantic. And he said that his job would, quote, not be a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job to fact-check Biden. Because the simple reality is that Biden doesn't lie nearly as often as Trump does. And so, no, we're not going to be fact-checking the guy, and we're not going to be assuming that Biden is lying every time he speaks, like we did with Trump, because Biden doesn't lie as often as Trump did. Or does. That is your drive-by media, ladies and gentlemen. The latest incarnation. Drive-by media here. Scott, Miami, great to have you. Glad you waited. You're up next, sir. Hello. Hello, Mr. Limbaugh. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm so happy that GameStop and AMC were shorted. Now Wall Street knows how it feels to be swindled. They got beaten at their own game, and of course they hate it. You know what? This hits home for me because on September 15, 2008, my parents and I were swindled out of $190,000 in common stock when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, deliberately caused by the greed uh, and incompetence of disgraced CEO oh. Richard Fold, who destroyed the 157-year-old legendary investment bank. And of course, uh, thousands of Lehman employees lost their jobs. And thousands of Lehman investors were wiped out. My parents went to their graves, never getting reimbursed by Lehman Brothers, nor the SEC. I hold and will always hold accountable greedy and evil Jew bankers who stole our money. And that's how I feel, Mr. Limbaugh. Well, I'm, you know what? There was a great movie made about, about that, about Lehman Brothers, or Lehman Brothers, I'm pronounced both ways. And I'm trying to think, I think the name of the movie was Margin Call. Uh, it featured Kevin Spacey. He didn't hit on any young boys in the movie, um, so it's okay. I think it was Margin Call. I'm gonna I'm gonna find out before the program ends. But it it, it it's not stated that it's about Lehman. But you have to know what happened, which you obviously do. You have to be familiar with the circumstances of the so-called economic crash of 2008. But this is specifically about Lehman Brothers. And their, at the time, notoriously famous CEO, who is portrayed beautifully by Jeremy Irons. So you will love this movie if you've got a, a problem with Lehman Brothers and what they did to your family and so forth. But the, the, you're, you're absolutely right about the GameStop story. There is no question that this, and you know how we know it's about it? Because they keep denying. They keep saying, oh, Rush, you're missing, no, 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 you're, you're missing the point. It's not, it's not what you think at all. That means it is. The GameStop guys, the Reddit guys, essentially, a bunch of populists, they're more powerful than people think. They're smarter than people think. The establishment had no idea how smart they were. They kept talking about them, referring to them as, uh, I can't remember the term, but it was very insulting. Just the you know, normal, it was a very insulting term. I can't remember what it was. But it was indicative of the lack of respect they had for these guys that were using Reddit uh, and Robin Hood to actually engineer massive losses for these gigantic uh, hedge funds and so forth. And so that it, you notice how fast people stepped up. No, no, no. There's nothing to this political comparison that Limbaugh is making. No, 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 no. You can't look at it that way. This, no, 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 no. You can't. There's no political similarity. Then you know there is. He did. What, the last caller made comments about what? 
Ah, uh, damn it. See, I didn't hear that either. I just was told that the last caller made some comment about Jew bankers. We we then hung up on the guy. Um, Scott in Miami was his name. I'm sorry, folks. I just I didn't hear it. Um, I just I didn't hear it. Yeah, I couldn't hear what he was. I couldn't hear 90 percent of what he was saying, which is why I'm recommending the movie to him. It's the closest way I could think I could vamp to whatever he was reacting to. Sheila in Oahu. Hawaii. Great to have you on the EIB network. Hello. Aloha, Rush. Aloha. Thank you. Hi. I just wanted to say first that my husband and I pray for you every night. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. We all do. Thank you very much. (laughs) And my question is, um, I've heard a lot of things today, but going back to this AOC situation, I'm just a little bit concerned about her mental well-being. I mean, she believes that Ted Cruz is having her murdered. And now she's you know, bringing up this, this horrible situation that whether she went through it or not, we don't know. But my question to you, because you're so brilliant, is do the members of Congress also have aptitude tests or, you know, because uh, President Trump, they always question his sanity. Of course, Biden's will probably be tested very soon. And I was just wondering if the members of Congress also have this scrutiny, you know, because their constituents deserve it. So I'm going to throw that back to you and see if you can enlighten hey, Wait, 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 wait. I've never heard it. What, what aptitude test are you talking about? Well, I mean, they've always said, you know, that they're not fit for duty because of, you know, their, their ways of thinking. And I'm just wondering, I mean, the, the girl may need some you know, counseling or something, and she does believe that Ted Cruz oh, is trying oh, to oh, kill her. I, I, you're using your own language. There, there, there is no aptitude test that members of Congress have to pass to prove their qualifications. You're just, that's how you're describing the Democrats' um, talking about the Republicans not being worth their salt or whatever. Anyway, uh, Sheila, thanks much for the call. I appreciate it. I got to run. We'll be back in just a second. Don't He's America's adult. Rush Limbaugh on the EIB Network. Welcome back, Rush Limbaugh. Half my brain tied behind my back just to make it fair. And as always, talent on loan from God. We utilize both factors each and every day. Okay, folks, you shop for the best price you can find on insurance, on home mortgages, on vacation travel, maybe even cheeseburgers. I don't know. So why not do the same thing with cellular phone service? It's not like your other utility bills, electricity or water, where you have little say over how much your big bill is. Your cell phone number is your own, and who you choose for cellular service is all up to you. One company makes a compelling offer. It's worth thinking about. One company makes such a compelling offer. It's worth thinking about. It's pure talk. They offer you unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data for just $30 a month. And guess what? If you go over on the data, they don't charge you for it. Pure talk. They don't charge you. Now, you know why. I mean, six six gigs of data is a lot of data. The average ordinary American, that is a tremendous amount of data. So they're pretty safe on that. But even so, if you go over it, they will not charge you. Compare that monthly price, $30 a month, to your current cell phone bill, and you'll see why it makes sense to change. Now, I don't know what your cell phone bill is, but I would wager you that it's 60 bucks or more. Maybe 120 maybe 75 or more. This outfit, Pure Talk, is offering you unlimited talk Unlimited text and six gigs of data for $30 a month. Now, Pure Talk knows they're in the same business with the likes of AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile. In fact, get this, they use the same cell towers 
of one of the big companies that covers 99% of the country. I'm not allowed to tell you which one, but trust me, they use the same cell towers, meaning connectivity, as one of the big companies. They offer superior service. 100% of the Pure Talk customer support team is right here in America. So you make one phone call to them today, you can start to save money by switching to Pure Talk. All you do is get your cell phone and dial pound 250. Next, you say Pure Talk. It's that simple. You'll save 50% off your first month. That's pound 250 and then say Pure Talk. One of the Pure Talk customer service people be right there on the phone to help you. And by the way, it's legit. $30 a month, unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data. Pure Talk USA. Okay, who's next? Uh, Gary, Cape May, New Jersey. Great to have you, sir. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Mega Prayers, uh, Rush. Two things I want to tell you, Rush. Number one, quit apologizing. You have nothing to apologize for. If people can't keep up with what you're saying, so bad. But we understand what you're saying. Thank you, sir. Number Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And number two, over the last few weeks, I've heard you say that you feel you failed in, in getting your message out there about liberalism. I want you to know that you have absolutely not failed. You have not failed, sir. We understand. Okay? And we wish you all the best. Be well. Well, thank you. you know, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, let me share something that I saw this morning also during show prep period. And it's, it was Fox, so it's not going to appear anywhere but there. But there were some Keystone XL pipeline workers who've been let go because Biden has shut it down. And they were reacting to having their jobs taken away, eliminated. And they were, they were bemoaning the fact that they now got to rely on $15 an hour minimum wage or... They've now got to rely on um, selling solar panels. And I'm watching this. And I don't know if any of the people, it looked like about 15 people who were part of the, uh, the protest. I don't know if any of them listen to this program. But I kept, I just couldn't stop thinking, why are you people surprised? What do you think the Democrat Party is? What do you think? All this climate change argument is about. It's, it's, it's clear as a bell that they have no desire to enhance your life. They're taking jobs away from you. This is what Biden and his administration are hell-bent on doing. They want you to become dependent on them. They want you to become the old term, a ward of the state. You're not supposed to have enough power to oppose them. So they shut down the Keystone XL pipeline and tell you to go out and sell solar panels or whatever. You're supposed to be grateful. Now, I was happy to see these guys standing up and protesting. But I found myself asking, how many of them voted for Biden or how many of them vote for Democrats? I don't know. There's no way of knowing. But it was, um, it was it's along the lines of me Suppose they listen to me. Suppose they've heard me talk about all this and they didn't pay it any attention. Or maybe they did. Maybe they voted for Trump and I'm just don't know what I'm talking about. But it was the odds are that there are a lot of people, coal miners, a lot of people that voted for Biden who had no idea what he's going to do and what's yet to come. That's why I say they're going to overstep, and it isn't going to take them long, and it isn't going to be pretty when all kinds of people start to figure it out. He didn't start it, but he'll be happy to finish it. Rush on the EIB Network. <laughs>